<laughs> Good morning, you guys. We are already laughing. I am here with Dr. Willie. If you are new here, my name is Lauren. This is Dr. Willie. He's my functional medical doctor. And we have just started, what, what did we, you named it. I don't what, we call it the Lauren Warren Hour. <laughs> We've just started doing this to talk about perimenopause, menopause symptoms, things that you can actually get some information from a functional medical doctor, walk away today, and start implementing them do in so. your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really quick before we start, you're probably wondering, if you're new to my channel, you're probably wondering, why is someone that talks about makeup all the time talking about perimenopause? It's me. <laughs> it's you. Yeah. He's the face. <laughs> no, but... One thing that has happened to me over the last year is I started getting the weirdest symptoms. I started not feeling like myself and I decided I would start sharing about my journey of going through perimenopause. And the guy that's helped me the most, this doctor right here, who is my functional medical doctor, Dr. Willie, and he has so graciously offered to give this free advice to you guys. And so we're gonna use this time to answer your questions. But really what we wanted to do, we did another live, so make sure you, went, you go back and check it out if you haven't. But we did another live kind of answering everything. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> so this time, we're gonna break it down and just talk about weight loss, weight gain. I know a lot of you are really struggling with that, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So, before we start, I wanna introduce Dr. Willie. Will you tell us just a little bit about you? I thought you were gonna say, before we start, let's pray. That's, <laughs> I'm used to hearing that. It might be a we good idea. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. But so, anyway, go ahead. Okay. So, your question was, I'm sorry. <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been practicing? Tell us a little bit. What's a functional medical doctor versus a general practitioner? Let's start with that. Uh, so, the names changed over the years. When I first started what we now call functional medicine, it was the late 90s. And it was integrative medicine or anti-aging medicine mm -hmm. was the big term. And since aging is inevitable, you just want to optimize it, the, the names have changed. Mm -hmm. And so I like integrative physician or functional medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's based on the fact we don't just treat symptoms. We don't put band-aids on things because what do band-aids do? They fall off. Yeah, it's a very good. They I love that analogy. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Bandies fall off yeah. and the wound's still there. So we try to find out, a lot of docs in my position would say we look for the cause, we treat the cause. I don't. I say I look for the why and I treat the why because that's very different. And that's awful deep. We won't get into that now. But we try to find the reason why you're having these symptoms, figure out the why, help you optimize and fix the why. And that's another big part of this type of medicine is we try to give you the tools to do it because I'm not a, well, okay, I am a shaman. I dance around people with face paint on once in a while, but I'm not God. So I'm gonna teach you how to take care of yourself because I'm looking at stuff, markers in your body, in your blood, in your urine, in your hair, and most importantly, hearing you. Sit and listen, I think that's one of the biggest differences yeah. between yeah my type of practice and a, and a standard practice, I'm not with someone for five minutes, I'm with them for an hour. Yeah, yeah, and at you're least. listening to their whole complaints, like what's yeah. going on. It's almost like a therapy session a little bit. <laughs> I felt like yeah. finally heard when I sat down with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, and we sit and listen, and, and that's so important because medicine and science in general, we're always taught that the, the typical scientific method is to remove the observer, to try to limit bias. But how can I look at your labs but not listen to what you're telling me? Right. That's the way we were trained. Yeah. Though these labs are within normal limits, she's fine. Well, wait a minute, doc, why do I feel this way? Right. I remove the observer. So in our type of practice, we don't do that. We want you, I wanna hear what you're saying, and then I'm gonna correspond the labs to it, not make my diagnosis with the labs. I love that. And I think that just goes, and I don't wanna to go too far into all of this, because we did this last time. Yes, did. But like people saying, you know, women saying, I went and I saw a general practitioner, I saw someone, they said my blood levels were normal, they didn't listen to any of my symptoms, I still feel horrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference, right? There is what Dr. Willie said, is the difference between going to a functional medical doctor versus someone who's not trained like that, because you're gonna get heard when you go to a functional medical doctor. Yeah question before we start where does someone find a functional medical doctor like where do they go because that's something that a lot of women cannot they're having a hard time finding one so uh one site's called the institute of functional medicine and forgive me i don't know the web address the other one's a4m <clears throat> excuse me which stands for the american academy of anti-aging and regenerative medicine i think their website is worldhealth.net you write that down for us i'll post this <laughs> yeah we'll post that those those have uh doctor finders 
So in all 50 states, you can find someone who's trained like I am. And then it's just, I would encourage everyone, interview them, get reports about them, talk to their family members, whatever you have to do, see if the dog ever been kicked, whatever. You wanna know this is the right person for you. Cause it is a very, it is a personality uh, system, if you will. If you don't really trust and get along with the person, you're not gonna get your problems mm -hmm. listened to or heard. And they may, and their intentions are probably well, but we all have, we don't get along with everybody. The people that get along with everyone are, are politicians and we all know how we can trust them. You're, you're spicy today. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, I'll, you, don't get started on politicians. We're not gonna talk about that, we're not, not gonna do that. that. Okay, um, yes, I will post this. This will be reposted on my page as soon as we are done. Um, you can go back and watch this. And then I do have, um, it, we have someone actually taking notes today, so I can go back and put them in the comments um, to answer some of the questions that I know you're gonna come back and ask. So, okay, let's jump straight into weight gain. Biggest question, well, not the biggest. So there's a lot of symptoms with Yeah, watch what you say when you say big I know. <laughs> the, most people are complaining as they're hitting their 40s. The, one of the things that they're noticing is weight gain in the belly. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been in shape their whole life. They're starting to gain weight. I know I had the same thing. You know, you were exercising. You feel like you're eating correctly, doing all the things that you felt like you kept in shape before, and now nothing's working. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of break it down. What can people do? Why is this happening? So let's just start with the causes. Okay, yeah, great question. So I like to use the analogy, when you go to college, you're in the freshman 15, and when you start the perimenopausal process, perimenopausal process, it's the 40 you gain. So it's, when you're 18, 20, 21, uh, weight loss, weight gain literally is from the neck down. If you wanna lose your fat, you exercise more, you eat less. But after you're 30, 35, and definitely past 40, weight loss is from the neck up. You yeah. cannot undereat your fat, you cannot overexercise your fat. And when you do, you usually get fatter. Because back to the head and neck, from the neck up, exercise good, right? More, better, with classic alcoholic mentality, if one beer is good, 12 is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exercise is the same way, mm -hmm. but from the neck down, it's a stress. It's a stress. So the cortisol levels. Cortisol levels, sympathetic tone. Okay. You're, you're, in other words, it becomes a hormonal issue where the stress of your exercise, the stress of trying to eat right, is causing your weight gain and definitely not weight loss while you're doing all these things. And that's so frustrating because the fitness industry, the food industry, these multi-trillion dollar industries are keeping you in this paradigm because that's how they make money. Right. Oh, it's, you know, the reason you're not losing weight when you're running, you got the wrong shoes. Yeah. But it, but that's the thing, too. I mean, as a, just a, I'm just a normal observer of all this, trying to figure out things on my own. But I see women saying, you know, heavy strength training, high protein diet, and, you know, intermittent fasting. There's all of these, like, key trigger words, right, that we're all hearing. As soon as you start hearing about perimenopause, you hear these key things. And so we're doing all of these things. I think we're putting in all these supplements into our body just because we're thinking like, okay, it's gonna help, but almost we have that reverse effect, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, let's break down. Why, why are women, what do, you, what do you mean when you say weight is coming from the neck up? Like what oh, does that great. mean? So it really becomes a hormonal issue. It really is. I did a lecture exactly a year ago in Chicago and the title was the role of sex hormones in weight management. We forget that when women's hormones start changing 15 years prior to actual menses stopping. So by definition, menopause occurs at roughly the age 51 in our country. And that is a clinical event, the cessation of menstruation for 12 months. But we know that hormones actually start changing 15 years prior. Mm. And that's very important. That's key because it's all the hormones, not just the sex hormones, they're all related. Mm -hmm. And I kind of look at hormones in a, I had a, a wonderful nurse practitioner student, she's, she's recording it. <laughs> uh, uh, just yesterday I asked, what would you put in order of importance for hormones? So the analogy I like is a pyramid. Uh, the, above the pyramid are all your neurotransmitters. So your norepinephrine, dopamine, your happy hormone, your acetylcholine, all these things are there. The tip of the pyramid, pyramid is your pituitary gland. The eye of the pyramid is your thyroid. Mm -hmm. Two bases of the pyramid are your adrenal gland. And then the base, the base base of the pyramid are your sex hormones. And then in between, we have all the gut hormones, all the other hormones that are involved. And you kind of look at like that flow that you have to deal with the neurotransmitters. You have to change the brain to lose weight. 
then make sure your thyroid's optimal. Pituitary to sex hormones is doing what it's supposed to. You keep cortisol at bay. You keep sympathetic tone as low as possible. That's how you lose weight as you get older. And that's how you prevent weight gain is when you get those hormones balanced. Sometimes you need someone like me in my training to help you do that. But really there's a lot you can do on your own with that. And I know we're going to get into that. Yeah. What can you do at yeah. home for that? I love that. Okay, so HRT isn't the only answer. That's no. that's what I want to kind of talk about because a lot of women, you know, either A, choose not to be on it or think, is this the only way? So that's what we're going to talk about mm -hmm. is how you can walk away from this live. And if you aren't wanting to do hormone replacement or maybe you're just not there yet or you don't know if you're even a candidate, how can you walk away and just start making mm -hmm. some changes? Okay, so that, that was really good. Okay. I'm learning a lot just sitting here. I'm like, okay. So what can we do? Let's talk, let's talk um, lifestyle. What okay. can we change in our lifestyle at the age of, you know, 40 and older to kind of start losing that weight? Cool. So let's talk eating first and we'll talk exercise. Okay. Perfect. Eating, there's a thousand ways to eat. There's a thousand foods that'll kill you. There's a thousand foods that'll give you everlasting life. It's, it's not that. What you need to find is something that works for you and your family on a regular basis. Uh, a couple key caveats to that. Number one, we don't need as much protein as all you're hearing. Protein, 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 protein. You See, that not... is so hard for me because I that's don't... all I'm thinking I need. Well, and if I may, we've known each other for yes. almost 20 -something. 27 years. Yeah. And her husband and I both were competitive bodybuilders together. Mm -hmm. And the bodybuilding mentality to build muscle is protein, protein, yeah. protein. Well, that's spilled over into everyone else. Yeah. You don't need that much protein to survive. There's a couple great studies in boxers. And you know, boxers are some of the most fit athletic people yeah. in the world. They were on 40, 40 grams of protein a day and did not lose any muscle mass. For real? For real. That's interesting. There's a couple of those out there. Wow. So I think we overdo the protein, which are extra calories, which adds mm -hmm. extra energy that then you have to figure out how to burn. Yeah. Uh, but I also think it limits choices too. It kind of puts you in a, in a, in a corner to say, I have to get more protein in. Mm -hmm. Um, that's number one. Number two, the style of eating, intermittent fasting, eat breakfast, don't eat breakfast, don't eat before you go to bed. It's confusing. It's confusing. What works for you? If you get up in the morning, you're hungry, have some. If you're not, don't eat. So listen to your body. Listen to your body. The whole idea of three square meals a day is actually based on the industrial revolution when they, people used to work for 18 hours a day and they took three breaks. Oh. And we get the squares. Yeah. Uh, this is so esoteric. They get the squares because on ships sailing across from Europe, yeah. all the dishes were squares because they stacked up easier, wouldn't fall over when the ship oh, was doing this. For real. True story. That's where So we we've get, just carried this on. We've carried it on and said it's now science yeah. and you need to do this way of eating. Mm -hmm. No. Eat to your schedule. Eat to how your comfort. Eat to your family life. The, the next thing is you don't always have to eat. Don't feel that you're, you're at the soccer game with your daughter and everyone's hungry, let's go to McDonald's. No, maybe maybe it's okay not to eat tonight. Yeah. Whoa, wow, that's oh that's that's child abuse. <laughs> no, no I mean, it's not. Well I think I think we I think too, I don't know if this is a normal thing, but I think, you know, listening to our bodies, whatever, we're so used to eating so much mm -hmm. that then we listen to our bodies and we're like, Oh, I need my ne my next meal, I need my next meal, instead of being like Am I actually hungry? And I think that goes back to your brain. Am I right when Absolutely I say that? Absolutely right. Your yeah. brain needs to learn how to shut off. And yeah. so kind of maybe, uh, I, don't, I don't, how do you do that though? Like how do you go from like being used to eating so many meals or someone like me who's trying to get in so much protein and feeling like you're failing because you just can't get that in. Like what, where, how do you teach your brain to? I like using the term food noise. And this is how you start. Evaluate the food noise that's going on up here. How often are you thinking of food? Is food a prevalent thought? A certain type of food, a time of day that food noise gets louder? The first step, just like an, a, a, an AA program, is recognize the problem. Yeah. To turn down the food noise, admit it, uh, acknowledge it, and then do something different. Maybe go for a walk. Maybe call up an old friend sit and read don't watch tv do, don't do social media flipping because that turns your brain off and you easily start eating at that yeah, point that is true so recognizing food noise is the first step okay the second thing i would do with that is sit with your family uh your roommates whatnot and figure out what is the best eating schedule for us and then if it's going to be different for everybody and that's okay mm -hmm. that's now trust me there's no one that appreciates 
family meals as much as I do, but sometimes in today's world, it doesn't work. Yeah, we're busy. We're busy, and yeah. so don't put pressure on people to sit and eat when they're not hungry. They can sit and be with you, but they don't necessarily have to yeah. eat. So really, that's the most, the simplest advice I can give on eating is eat to your schedule, eat when you're hungry, keep your portions low, and do not listen to food noise. Okay. Are you a proponent in like weighing your food or do you think that becomes like kind of crazy? That's OCD. Yeah. I mean, yes, okay, so my favorite way to look at food is roughly the size of your fist for a carb or protein at a meal. Okay. That's all you need. You don't need okay. a lot. That's the measurement I was looking for because yeah. I think a lot of us don't know what portion control is too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you can, and, and think about it, that's about the size of an apple or an orange. Mm -hmm. That's a couple spears of broccoli. That's about a half cup of rice. That's about a three ounce piece of meat yeah that's all you need pick a carb and a protein don't worry about the fat component of it again that's too anal and do that a couple times a day when you're hungry so that's it food timing are you a proponent of like cutting off food at a certain time of night it is definitely better for you to go to bed on an empty stomach and there's a number of reasons the simplest one is reflux people get reflux yeah. and everyone's on these drugs called ppis which are poison we won't go there um uh but also the hormones respond better. Growth hormone goes higher and more powerful when your stomach's empty. Oh. And that helps you sleep, builds muscle, burns fat. It's a hormonal response again if you go to bed on an empty stomach. And by definition, that's 90 minutes. Okay, So if you can minutes. eat dinner, even if it's late, and wait 90 minutes before you go to bed. Let me throw in one thing, a little uh, uh, jump ahead to exercise. One of the most powerful exercise things you can do is after that last meal, go for a 20 minute walk. Mm -hmm. That's it. That is the most metabolic, active thing you can do for your body. Not 30 minutes, not two hours in the gym. 20 minutes. 20 minute walk after your last meal. Huge for you. And what's really neat, do it with your family. Do it with a loved one. Yeah. Do it with your dog. You can take your cat if you want, good luck. Um, but Your mental health, I think, also benefits awesome. from that. Absolutely, know? yep. It, it changes the way your body digests the food, the way you view food. It changes the hormones. It's weight loss from the neck up. I love that. Simple. Simple, simple. things that and, people and can really go do. It's Aquaman's razor. The simple solution is always the correct one. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem. We have so much information overload that people like me are like, I don't even know what to do. Yeah. And then you don't do anything because you, <laughs> you don't know what to do. Well, you get a bag or of burritos you, you and know, just you say, just, screw it. You're just frustrated. You give up. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, yes, I will be um, posting this after. So don't worry if you're just jumping on. We're talking about weight gain in perimenopause and menopause, what you can do, how you can take, it, take away from here, um, and go start implementing some things to help you. Um, and But I will be reposting it, and we'll be putting the key points down in the comments too. So no worries. Okay, let's talk really quick about exercise okay so you you talked about walking what else one thing i do think and maybe i'm wrong because i'm just average person here is we lose a lot of muscle yeah i know i've lost a lot of muscle and i've had to work really hard to keep that muscle back on so is that something is that a reason why we're gaining weight too does that have any correlation that's a great question indirectly possibly directly no okay muscle does burn calories more so than non-muscle tissue right. uh, but really the biggest calorie burn in your body is your liver and your brain believe it or not, Did not know that. um it muscle changes with age uh, the medical term is called sarcopenia mm -hmm. and sarcopenia is a natural they call it natural progression of muscle loss with age okay. i think that's a non-use issue Okay. In other words, we do less, we work more, we're stationary more, we're seated more. Yeah. That's what causes muscle loss. You don't okay. need to have 200 grams of protein a day. You don't need to lift weights for two hours a day, but you do need to do resistance exercises. You do need to have the adequate calories to support the, pro the muscles. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said in most women listening to this, 40 to 60 grams of protein is probably adequate. Probably people aren't getting that. I mean, to, they're I they're probably either not getting it or they're getting ten times as much. Yeah. Which is yeah. now it's a caloric issue, and that's not going to lose weight with all those calories. Yeah, because I'm aiming for way more than forty to sixty. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Again, simply so, and the resistance training program. If you like the gym, go for it. But just remember, it's a stress. 
So non-stress exercise for wonderful people at home, especially the, the 30, 40 year olds who usually have kids at home, is home-based strength training. And my favorite, home-based Pilates, home-based yoga, 15, 20 minutes, three times a week of a strength-based Pilates program at home on your floor when the kids go to school, will do as much as you go into Gold's Gym for two hours a day. Actually, you'll do more because you won't be stressed. Interesting. <laughs> That's it doesn't take like, doesn't again, take as much as we think. No, mm -hmm. obviously you want the rest of the time you want to move as much as possible. That's just good for you. But movement doesn't cause weight loss. I, I talk to people all the time. But well, Doc, I'm always I'm always moving my job. I'm running from this to here, or I'm a construction worker. I don't lose weight. When you do something every day, your body gets quite used to it. It's not a way to lose weight loss. That's just you. Right. Plan purposeful movement is how you incorporate exercise to get rid of fat. And that's that two to three times strength Pilates a week, and that's walking after dinner every night. I love that. That's easy. It's we can easy. do this. We it's can do easy. this. Yeah. Ladies, we can do this. Okay. Um, okay, my next question, bloating. That's another mm -hmm. thing that people are having an issue with. Can we can we relate that with weight loss or weight gain? Or Because a lot of us think we're gaining weight on the midsection, but sometimes I know for myself it was a lot of bloating. Mm -hmm. What can we do for bloating? That might look like weight gain, but maybe it's not. Sure. So bloating has a number of factors behind it. One that's really not recognized is your iliopsoas muscles. So you know the exercise you see in the gym where yeah. you put we weight on your hips and yeah, you hip. thrust your yeah. hips? Mm -hmm. That alone can cause bloating because it's such an irritant to those muscles that your belly's sitting on. Um, you know, the, just being in our society, forgive me, I was trying to think of a nice way to say that. Just the way we are, the antibiotics we take when we get a sniffle, the, the, mm -hmm. our food choices, our, the toxins in the environment, all these things are very gut negative. And the gut, our guts have a problem. And I don't care whether you, if you have no diarrhea, no constipation, no bloating, no pain, no belly issues, if you live in America, you have a gut issue. Yeah. You have yeah. a gut issue. Yeah. So the answer is not necessarily taking probiotics and stuff, but there's some things you can do for bloating to help. And that is, again, back to the easy stuff. If you have a dog, let it, let it lick your face. Go play in the garden, play in dirt. There's your probiotics. For good prebiotics for bloating, take a tablespoon of kimchi or sauerkraut every day. That's prebiotics. That's the good food that feeds the good bacteria. A simple tablespoon of that every day does wonders. Really? For your gut health. What if, what if you don't like that? Uh, you <laughs> could do... What's another option? <laughs> you know, I don't think I can do sauerkraut. I just don't think I can. You're German? <laughs> no, that's Nick's favorite food is sauerkraut. I thought so, yeah. Favorite food. Yes. I, I, I was like, wait a minute, I've seen sauerkraut in your house. The smell makes me want to just like, ugh, I can't, I can't do it. Sorry about that. I can't. Okay, so what's any, next? What's any another? fermented food. Oh, okay. Which there's a bunch, but I don't know all. Okay. Uh, fermented food. Apple cider vinegar may work. Oh, okay. uh, it's a it's a vinegar. Okay. Uh, something okay. fermented will do, do it, and you can ferment stuff yourself. You know, get a cucumber, cut it up, soak it in vinegar with some salt and pepper overnight. Oh yeah. Incredible snack, and it's going to feed your good bacteria. Oh, okay, I can do that. I Simple like that. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Um, okay. Oh, what about fiber? Is that important too? Fiber is very important. As a matter of fact, the prebiotic you want is called a short chain fatty acid, which is fiber. Okay. That's fiber. So yes, getting fiber in our diets is very important. Um, that's part of my issue with juicing. People that say, you know, I juice every morning. I blend up my oranges and my yeah, yeah, my yeah. apples and stuff. And I always ask, well, what do you do with the pulp? Well, I throw it away. That's the most fibrous part. That's right? the yeah. fiber part. And yeah. I heard this one from a guy, and forgive me, I'm going to slaughter his name, Luskig. He's a pediatric endocrinologist out west somewhere. He had the greatest saying once at a lecture. He said, fruit is a poison with antidote, antidote built in. Hmm. So if you just have the juice, if you give your kids a glass of orange juice every morning, yeah. poison. Really? Give them an orange because it has the fiber. Interesting. Huh. That could be a whole other conversation. Yeah, that's a whole conversation. <laughs> like, interesting. I, you know, I've heard that, but I, I, yeah, we'll go into that another time because I do want to know more about that. Okay, we had a question. How does testosterone play in weight gain? What's the role of that? And if you're low in testosterone, is that going to be a problem with weight gain? So, yes, actually. All the hormones are involved in weight-related issues. Testosterone in particular, um, and it, it requires a little history in women testosterone because there's so much misnomers out there. Yeah. Um, women's testosterone is released by your ovaries, your adrenal glands, and your skin. You convert roughly 15% of your testosterone 
in your skin. So as women go through menopause, they lose 50% of their testosterone production. So as a matter of fact, replacing testosterone in women is FDA approved for menopausal women, but it's not FDA approved for premenopausal women. Really? Right. Over the course of your cycle, testosterone peaks around ovulation because it increases libido. You want to have babies, that's what you do. And then it's more steady state release over the rest of the month. Testosterone is low because of other hormones, primarily cortisol, insulin, mm -hmm. our diets, lack of exercise. That's who we see low testosterone in. So you can fix it on your own by changing those things. Okay. Changing those things. A lot of what it's, we're talking about. A lot of what we're talking about, yeah. And, and, and I think it's important, too, to point out that libido or your, your drive or want for sex in women is a little testosterone related. Men, it's very testosterone related, but it's not as much so in women. Libido, women, is your husband kissing your neck when you're at the sink, helping you clean after the kids, taking the garbage out. That's libido. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my lovely you bride, listening? who you know well, <laughs> yes. she's the most wonderful woman in the world. She's great. She taught me very early in our marriage. She goes, I'm a crock pot and you're a microwave. <laughs> I, I learned it. it. You did. I and learned you it. That. I was like, I love that. Oh, wow. So, okay. Men, so it's, it's a, okay. That's a whole, we'll get on to Yeah, that's, that's another, another topic that's there. That's another see? topic. We'll get there. We'll get there. But Let I me love go back that. to testosterone yes, for you. So, so testosterone, when we measure it, one, it has to be at the right time of the month. We have to know where you are in your monthly cycle so we can say, okay, this is appropriate for this time of month. Um, that's the first thing. Number two, testosterone replacement does give women a jump. Testosterone increases a hormone in your brain called dopamine. That's your happy hormone. And so when women get testosterone replaced, they feel great. Testosterone does burn fat. It does build muscle. That's why us guys can miss a meal and lose five pounds and you wonderful yeah, women can fair. look at a meal and gain five yeah, pounds. Yeah, it's not fair. Right? It's not fair. No, no. Talk to God about that. <laughs> but yes, so testosterone replacement can do a lot for women, but I encourage you don't rely on it alone. Okay. Because uh, Eric Clapton in his song, Cocaine, says, don't forget the fact you can never get it back. And what he means by that is once you do a line of coke, you'll never get the same feeling again with all the coke in the world. So it's the same Test with testosterone? Testosterone's the same thing. That's like the pellets. I it's felt the, like I had that. I did the pellets. Mm -hmm. You feel great the first time. The best and I felt. And then I never got it again. It back. Mm -mm. There you and go. I hear that a lot. Like uh, women are like, I'm on testosterone pellets. It worked for about a month, two months, and now I feel horrible again. Yep. Yep, you got it. You got it. That's back to you. You have to have the balance of all the hormones. You can't just treat one, replace one. Another reason, test, and I can we can go on a long time on testosterone. I've written books on this, so you know that. So yeah, shut me up if yeah. I keep going. But a lot of uh, our drugs out there lower testosterone in women, particularly birth control pills, because it increases something called sex hormone binding globulin, and that binds up your testosterone. So there's a lot of reasons for low testosterone. I would say in all the almost 30 years I've done this, the ninety percent of women of premenopausal age, I can fix their testosterone without giving them testosterone. Interesting, because I feel like we need to um, we need to do another segment on just that because birth control is a whole other avenue mm -hmm. that I hear a lot. So yeah. we will do another segment. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I feel like oh one other one I want to talk mm -hmm. about creatine for oh. women. Mm -hmm. So I've done my own research, and it might not be right, but I've heard creatine is really great for women, especially in their perimenopausal, mm -hmm. menopausal. But then I also have a lot of women that are like, creatine makes me lose my hair, that are making me gain weight. Like, women are really scared of creatine. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on creatine? I would like to know for myself. So. Creatine is awesome. Um, just a little background on that. Creatine is an amino acid found particularly in red meat. As a matter of fact, roughly a six ounce steak has five grams of creatine in it. Um, creatine, uh, I'll, I'll cover the side effects first. There was one study, and I think it was 2009, because I remember it, that was concerned that creatine could cause hair loss. Mm -hmm. It was never followed up, and there's never been another study on that. So something else might is probably going on. Probably like high cortisol levels or something else. There's always more okay. than one variable. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Creatine, uh, when you take it in supplement form, does wonders from the hair follicle to the toenails. It increases cognition, increases water intake by the 
uh, cell. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be a potential or side effect. Some women feel bloated or heavier. Mm -hmm. That's water. Okay. Yeah, don't let don't let a two or three pound weight gain with creatine bother you. It's water. Okay, it's that's water. good to know. Okay. It will uh, help protect against the ma muscle mass loss of aging and menopause. Just five grams a day, three to five grams is the typical dose for a woman in an eight to 12 ounce glass of water. I do mine first thing in the morning I on an empty too. stomach. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it really does a lot for everything. I think it's a wonderful supplement. Mm -hmm. We're starting to use it more and more. There's a lot of literature coming out for in the dementia patients, oh. Alzheimer's and stuff, using creatine and seeing improvements in cognitive function. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot we don't know about that amino acid, but yeah. I think it's, it, I think it's a wonderful way for women to help maintain their muscle mass as they get older. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Then I'm doing the right thing. Okay, yes. good. Okay, I feel like we addressed pretty good. Yeah, I kind of went off on tangents too, no, so no, sorry no. about that. No, it was so good. So I feel like we've kind of addressed the weight gain um, and given you, you know, as much as you can get without going to see a functional medical doctor, correct? Yeah. Okay, so hopefully, you know, you, you're going to leave here and you're going to be like, okay, I have kind of a plan, what I'm going to do. Maybe you can implement some of the things that you haven't been implementing and, and see some results. So. The last thing, because I don't want to keep this too long, and you and I love to talk. So yes, we kinda, do. I'm sorry, guys. We're going to turn this off and stay here for two hours. <laughs> I will put this on YouTube, too. So if you're not following my YouTube channel, you can fast forward a little bit easier that way. But you guys had a lot of questions, so I want to just do, let's just do like three. Okay. Because next yep. time, I'll, we'll, we'll just keep continuing this like database of questions. But um, let's talk, I, I circled some that I thought were good. Um, a lot of anxiety questions mm. are coming in. And since we're talking about diet, exercise, things like that, what are some foods that can help control anxiety? Oh, great question. Um, let's do exercise and diet. Okay. Exercise in and of itself is one of the best anxiolytics and other things that can control exercise that you can do. And that is a, it, it lowers sympathetic tone. That okay. fight, flight, or freeze response that drives anxiety, mm -hmm. regular exercise changes that, changes that response. Now, over-exercise, high cortisol levels, back to our head and neck thing, mm -hmm. that makes anxiety worse. So the appropriate amount of exercise, which we described. How do you, okay, but I, I just have a question. How do you know if you're doing too much exercise? If you're not seeing results, if you still feel crappy, if you're tired all the time, and you're blaming your husband, it's could be because you're exercising too much. Okay, that's good, perfect. I had to still have a husband. I know you did. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and then foods. Foods, anything that increases GABA, so the gamma amino butyric acid, God gave you a number of hormones to run away from a tiger and one hormone to go to bed, and that's called GABA. So GABAminergic food, foods are fruit and vegetables, the greens in particular, um, low fat foods are good. And again, back to the importance of eating small portion sizes. Larger portion sizes and too much food inhibit that gabinergic response. And so people actually get anxious. Mm -hmm. I get anxious going to, oh, you can eat buffets just because yeah. I know I'm going to get in trouble. But it's back to amounts to have a lot to do with it. Yeah. So there's no specific food. <clears throat> Not specific food that does it. There's some that would uh, focus on a lot of the greens in particular. But I think it's just it's as much as how you do it okay. as it is what you do. Okay. Okay. Someone asked, is there a brand of creatine that you recommend? Does it matter what kind of creatine you're taking? Yeah, it's pretty straight across the board because it's just an uh, uh, amino acid, but I like the creatine monohydrates. Yeah. I think they That's have the most I studies think. behind them. Yeah. And they're the cleanest and they're dirt cheap. And dirt cheap. And they, they can really do a lot for you. Okay. Um, all right. I've got a lot. <laughs> a lot of irritability and rage mm. issues, um, especially around your cycle. Is there anything we can be doing for that? Um, well, if people are dying, yes, that we we got to get more aggressive, and that's when yeah. using progesterone, cyclic progesterone, in women that deal with that does wonders. Mm -hmm. Progesterone uh, is converted to something called norpregnenolone, and then to GABA. So progesterone is a precursor to that calming hormone we just talked about. Yeah. And so women that really have issues around their cycle, I'll put them on cyclic progesterone. In other words, progesterone two weeks of the month. It really pretty much takes care of that. Um, there's always other reasons for that. There's other hormones. Right. So that one's kind of hard to say why. Okay. And there's also a lot of psychosocial, mental, emotional, spiritual things behind that too. Mm -hmm. So that's a real hard one to answer, answer? in this type okay. of situation. Okay. Okay. But it's very prevalent. You're right. Yeah. It's very prevalent. Yeah. And so the, probably the first thing I would do 
besides talk to a doctor about it, is get off. This is terrible. Get off social media. I, well, I no, I mean, it's not going <laughs> to be my away. business, but I but I do agree. Or or I always say follow people that inspire and uplift you versus yes. make you feel you know threatened or you know want that kind of lifestyle or jealous or competitive things like that that aren't yeah. feeding your soul. I think there that's really go. important. That's too, a good so. way to put it. Yeah, I like fun. I like my version better on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like it. Um, I'm gonna use it. <laughs> okay, um, one more. Let's see. Do, do, do. I have like so many, but I don't want to be like too detailed. Um, we've answered the testosterone one. Um, you want to do that one? Is that a hard one? Oh no, that's super easy. What's the safest supplement for menopause anxiety? Oh yeah, easy. easy. So. Um, probably my absolute top favorite is found the active ingredient in green tea, and that's L-theanine. L-theanine is an amino acid. It's a GABAergic precursor, uh, and you can get it in pill form. So taking 200, 400, 600 milligrams of L-theanine in pill form, within a half an hour, you're going to be calm. Okay. You'll have much less anxiety. It works on GABA just like the benzodiazepines, so Valium and Xanax mm -hmm. and stuff, but it doesn't have the side effect of those, and that is addiction and being loopy and falling asleep and stuff. L-theanine is a great one. Um, using some of the adaptogens, and there's different adaptogens based on your other symptoms. So one very calming one is called uh, um, Mangolia Bark or D-A-H-B. Yes, or, or, yes. Yeah, I love that, that one. one. Yeah, mm -hmm. that one's incredible. Uh, uh, Rhodiola is a little more activating, but Relora is a combination of Philodendron and Magnolia Bark. That's a very available adaptogen. Ashwagandha is one people take a lot, but ashwagandha is usually more activating. And so I have found that in my anxious patients, ashwagandha actually increases anxiety. Really? So I like using the calmer ones. Holy basil is another one, another adaptogen that's calming. Okay. Um, that's, so those are very cheap, over-the-counter ways to deal with the anxiety associated with menopause. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I need to get off ashwagandha. <laughs> I'm learning so much through this. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you you are so amazing. We love Dr. Willie and just appreciate all your knowledge. And thank you for doing this. Like, oh, it's so fun. Honestly, I'm hoping it helps women. Um, you guys, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. I'll send you a text yeah, so we can yeah, answer yeah. them. Um, After our last one, we text for like two we days did. back. I was I'll like, do I don't know this Tell answer. This. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> he's really great. Now, you're not on social media a lot because I know a lot of people were asking, how do I get hold of Dr. Willie? But he's not on social media a lot. He does have a website. I will put that on here when I post this. Um, but we'll be doing this again next month. Yeah, you're absolutely. Join as me again? often as you want, girls. Okay. I love doing it. I know. Especially so if it helps so many wonderful people. Yeah. That's, yeah. the, that's the goal in life. Help your neighbor. Yeah. Like, I, that's the thing, too. I just, I, I'm so passionate about it myself because, one, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm kind of in that age group and I've gone through a little bit of it, but I feel like I felt so alone, and I just don't want women to feel that way. Yeah, so I just really that. appreciate that. So, all right, you don't have to suffer, you guys. We're here to help you, and I just appreciate you hanging out. They love you. <laughs> They love you. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Anyways, all right, you guys, have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll see you next month. Yes, sounds hey, good. Thank bye, you. Bye, guys.